Hi, my name's Julian Gilby. I'm the director and co-writer and co-editor of A Lonely Place to Die. Uh, hi, I'm Will Gilby. I'm the co-editor, co-writer and the second unit director. And if you watch the credits at the end, there's a few other credits we got as well, I think. So there you go. Yep, absolutely. And I should thank our producers there, Carnaby. Um, I wanted to start this film with, with, with some sort of super close-ups and then cut wide uh, to the climbing shot a la there, which you shot from Curved Ridge. And my, my, my sort of reasoning behind that was that when you're actually climbing and you're in, you're in close and you're really concentrating, you're not necessarily looking at a thousand foot below your feet like there. Uh, these are our aerials over the Rannoch wall of Bukalet of Moor. You can see the weather there is really, really quite dodgy. So, yeah, yeah, there was one, basically we did one day of aerials um, uh, on the mountain, and that's basically you get two hours flying time, and you've got the helicopter for, what, about eight hours? But you only actually get to do two hours flying time up there. And that's our first reveal of Alec Newman, who in the wider shots is being doubled by Richard Bentley on the Rannoch wall there. Is, that, um, is it Agag's Groove or January Jigs for the climbing? Bit of both. Right, Bit okay, of both. Those go. are the two climbing and all, all, Yeah, all these close-ups were actually shot uh, hundreds of miles away. All the sort of close-ups of the gear, that was shot hundreds of miles away um, in a sort of location at Scatwell, north of Inverness. It's an unbelievable location, this. I was told by another climbing advisor who we didn't end up using that we'd never have got uh, Bucolet Eve more. It was going to be too much, uh, too, too tough to get this national heritage Scottish mountain the end of the day, I think, uh, with uh, Carnaby doing a bit of uh, sort of phone calls, a bit of wheeling and dealing, we got it for about 500 quid a day. But, um, yeah. But we did, we were originally planning to take the actors, uh, we sort of basically filmed this. Just to say, high. that's a digital shot on the camera there, the camera was off, so it that's a work. visual effect. But no, there's basically, there's sort of two main locations here, there's the one right at the top, which is the Rannoch Wall, which is sort of uh, the climbing doubles and one crew, and the actors here are sort of about a thousand foot further down the mountain? Or yeah, about, about, about 800, a thousand foot further down, both on an east face, you see, so they've still got the sun on them. But the original plan was actually to take these guys, put another 800 foot up to the foot of the Rannoch Wall and shoot it there, and that would have never, ever have happened in a million years, just with the guys trying to get the crew up there, because you have to do about two or three pitches of rope climbing to get there. So it's never going to happen. I planned this uh, eagle shot. Uh, very early on with the storyboards, I suddenly thought, well, if we've got a helicopter, let's try and get a sort of a bird's eye view of the mountain. I've always, you know, and I was really pleased with how that came out. Obviously, the bird we shot a few months later, which was a Harris Hawk up somewhere completely else. And one thing, actually, Melissa had a problem with, with her whole costume was that she wasn't very happy about her helmet. She thought it made her look a bit dumb. But then, in hindsight, she actually ended up quite liking it. I love so actually, the shot. It actually really helps as well. You got obviously got away. There's the one scene in the film where everyone's wearing helmets, but it's actually really helpful for filming because you can stunt double so much easier uh, with a wig and a helmet. It just makes things a hell of a lot. So just you know, that's a stunning. That's an epic shot. That it's lovely. Of course, the helicopter footage is shot on, and the whole film is shot on the Red One, um, which is a sort of 4K, very high definition digital camera. But all the aerial stuff is shot. Um, I can't remember what it's shot on, but it's sort of... HD out. cam equivalent, isn't it? Is that what it was, yeah. Yeah. Our stunt doubling going on here. Uh, we've actually digitally built up the side of the rock face lower down to match it in with Alec Newman as well. Um, again, I like all these little close-ups. That's, that's me. Yeah, that's you. That's me doubling there. Uh, and that, that shot there upside down. Somebody said, oh my God, how did you do those crazy upside down POV shots? And I took the 5D camera, turned it upside down in my hands while I wasn't, and just wiggled it about and hammed it up. And it looks, re and looks really cool. But least, failing that, you could have just shot it right way up and flipped it and flopped it, and it'd be yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly had, the same thing. Yeah, I suppose, yeah. And that's, that's me. There we yeah. go. That's my one bit of stunt dubbing in the film. That's more of my sort of POV buggering about. But yeah, this sort of whole sequence was shot um, in three days, was it? Or well, yeah, but we went back, didn't we? We went back in August to do, like, that's me, for example, with, uh, that's me abseiling, uh, actually being lowered, rather, holding the camera, then that's back to the aerials. I love the, I love the, the views from Curved Ridge, the, you get the real backdrops. Yeah, I know, it's fantastic. And it matches in, those climbing doubles match in so well. I was going to say, in the, in the wide shots here, uh, that you'll see in a second, uh, the guy in red there is obviously Ed Spilliers. But now there, it's a guy called Rob Jarvis. And he uh, went off this job, and a few months later, he climbed the north face of the Iger in one day. 
wow. in perfect conditions. He was an extraordinary mountaineer and, and wore a rather funny wig for that. But also those poor guys, because I was filming them from Curve Ridge, uh, and they, literally the weather came in, they were just basically stuck on that face for, for hours, just freezing their, freezing their nuts off, waiting for the helicopter to actually, because um, it couldn't, couldn't really sort of take off and film with the weather. So it kept getting rain on the lens, and you have to land every time you get rain on the lens and wipe it off. It's a bit of a pain. I love Michael Richard Plowman's score here. I think he really creates uh, Melissa's theme, you know. I think it's a really, really cool mainstream theme, you know. It, this is quite a glossy looking film and I don't, you know, I'm not going to apologise for that. I wanted it to have a quite mainstream look. And then this whole shot here isn't something this the helicopter camera people shot. Was it on the way? Yeah, we were getting some very bad weather. These were, these were, this was shot as the uh, helicopter was coming to see us and the weather, you'll see later on in the shot, the weather looks horrendous on the horizon. Um, you know, these aren't the most dramatic bits of the Highlands. I'd even call these bits Lowland Highlands, but it sort of leads into the Highlands. And uh, initially we didn't want to do a big title sequence like this, did we? We, did, we just sort of wanted to have a lonely place to die and move on. But funnily enough, for two reasons. Firstly, I think contractually, we had to put a <laughs> load of credits up at the start. And so I thought, well, if we're going to do that, we could sort of open and close the film with a nice Celtic sort of theme song, really make you feel like you're in Scotland, you know. And uh, and and the other thing was it, it just, uh, you know, it, it ultimately, if you, if you have to do it, you can... And I really wanted a bit of a break. I, I felt we needed a bit of a separation from the opening action scene to Melissa and Ed and Alec just walking down the hill having a bit of a chin wag afterwards and this broke it up I felt a wee bit more also I love the sky here as it comes in over the hill it's quite brooding very foreboding that's the word beautiful song this do you want to talk about Sophie Ramsey she did the closing song as well yeah Sophie Ramsey is a, a sort of a, a I suppose a family friend really and I, I got given a CD of hers and I was just amazed by her, her voice and then I heard this song which she'd never heard of actually and I asked her if she wanted to uh, meet Richard, uh, Michael Richard Plowman, sorry, and uh, and record this song, "The Burning of Ock and Dune," which is about a sort of a, a horrible slaughter. However many hundreds of years ago, uh, Ock and Dune Castle was burnt to the ground by the Clan Macintosh. And I mean, all those songs are sort of sad, tragic laments. And I thought she did a brilliant job with it. And now we're back at um, Scatwell Estate, which is where we shot the bulk of the film. This is sort of towards, I suppose, the east coast of Scotland. Uh, we've just been on Battle the west. middle, yeah. Yeah, sorry, yeah. the middle. My but geography is absolutely it's terrible. terrible. I kept getting lost. I love the sky there. It almost looks green screen. It was such a such a cool sky with the. It's a really nice contrast to the cloud and the blue sky, and it just looks really really cool. Again, shot very simply that sequence. Just a wide, and a tighter shot there, and it just it's, it does all it needs to do, you know. Right. Because we don't surf. I like that. That's Ali time lapsing in August. You and I would have actually been on that face as that was being shot there. Shooting those shots, those upside down shots you were talking yeah. about. Yeah. The art department's done a great job here. Everything because I wanted that front porch that wasn't there. I can't see the difference between the rocks, uh, you know, the fake stones. That whole porch there that they've just come out of has just been added on. And yeah, they made, it, they made just... it look more rustic because actually they've, they're still, you know, up there, you know, Scotland isn't as rustic as this movie makes out in places. You know, they had satellite dishes and all sorts. So we had to get rid of that. Yeah, no, isn't you have a sort of storybook fairy tale idea of what it's going to be like with all these sort of beautiful twee villages and sort of, you know, and it just it isn't. Yeah, it's not really like that. But... Melissa and I were in agreement just looking at her there. I very much thought that the character of Alison was definitely a brunette and not a blonde. And Melissa is perhaps more well known for being sort of blonde. But uh, having said that, she uh, she wanted to do the brunette thing as well. So I, th I think it just makes her have a bit of a different look for this movie, which I really, really like. Do you want to talk about any other actors here? This is a basic party. There's Ed Spillers, Alec Newman, Gary Sweeney. Well, it's interesting because over here, you know, Fred West, you've got to, you've got to give the man a mention. You know, he's, he's very famous in the UK for all the wrong reasons. Um, but that gets a good laugh in the UK or in the theatres I was in. In the US, of course, no one knows who Fred West is, so maybe they'll dub that in the US, Jeffrey Dahmer, or, I don't know, someone else. Yeah, except that, yeah, this underground burial thing, so it's different. Enjoy. We've had a right result. 
that's basically Melissa was influenced by Scott, our first AD, who sort of support, London supports accent. Dirty Millwall. And uh, basically, you know, she wanted to do a little sort of jokey London accent. And I think the fact that she smiles very sort of honestly means that she's not trying to do a good English accent there. Didn't you read, you read... Um... Oh, yeah, that review. I read a review that, that somebody said uh, that, that they, they really liked the film. The one big drawback was that Melissa did a really bad Scottish accent. And I'll be totally honest with you, she did a really bad Scottish accent. But... It's a terrible Scottish accent. It sounds American. Yeah, she wasn't, yeah. She's basically playing an American in the film. Uh, and that's why we've got a sort of a line later on. You know, this isn't Yosemite, Alison. The weather out here does exactly what it wants. I mean, you know, people from all nationalities go up to Scotland. And I do climb. think, yeah, I think if you ever go to climbing locations, I think that's quite honest. You, you go somewhere, uh, the people go for the climbing, and you meet people from all around the world. Um, you can go up to Scotland, meet people from New Zealand, absolutely everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, God, you go up to Fort William and you've got Americans, Italians, French, Swiss. You know, everyone's up there to do the north face of Ben Nervous and... You know, and of course the Americans as well. So you know it, it, that that side of it makes perfect sense. This is your classic. Actually, you know, usually you spend a lot of time in films trying to write mobile phones out, but it's actually it's fairly easy to in Scotland because. And that was another thing you there. Did you notice how he has printed out copies yeah, of so weather? They don't have the internet because he doesn't have the internet. So those will already be dated by a day, won't they? Yeah. But no, you basically it's quite hard to get reception. I found certainly when we were staying at the estate, there was no reception whatsoever. Now, another thing that I'd like to point out is that a lot of reviewers, and maybe this is a fault of yours and mine for being too uh, ambiguous, but Melissa and Ed are not girlfriend and boyfriend in our eyes at all. I remember in earlier drafts you thought you'd like to add a bit of chemistry between Melissa and the Alec Newman character, but for, Rob, me, yeah. for me, Ed and Melissa are most definitely... Ed and Alison are not girlfriend and boyfriend. A lot of people say... Yeah, a lot, too... yeah, a lot of people think that, don't they? Because they of... there's a little bit of flirting, but flirting doesn't mean you're going out with each other. But having said that, because I do tight shots of Melissa looking in the mirror, then she's in the bath and Ed's on his own. It could, people could construe that they're sharing the room or whatever. I don't know, though. I don't really like the idea of a woman in a sort of... You know, for this movie, why is, you know, you know she going out with such a little toy boy? I would have thought that the character Alison would have... You know, done done her toy boys years ago, and just been kind of slightly bored of all that. I mean, Melissa and I sort of chatted about the character, and we said Alison's probably a bit of a serial monogamist. She's probably had sort of nine or ten one-year relationships that have broken up for one or other reason, probably you know due to the selfishness, etc., of what her character does and loves doing. I just don't see Alison as going out with somebody ten years younger than her. It just it never. So you know, a lot of people assumed. I I feel incorrectly. You know. But yeah, I do think talking about her being a sort of selfish character in the sense that um, you know anyone does really extreme climbing or adventuring or whatever, I, I, I think that's made a lot harder by by having a family or a wife and kids. What do you think of this scene? In the actual sort of end result of this scene, because I, I remember it was quite easy, quite nicely written, and I like sort of uh, him doing the trick with the cards there. But I, you know, in hindsight, it's funny. The other day I was just saying I'd have taken two minutes out of this scene. Yeah, I know. Exactly. And my wife said you should have added two minutes in. Did you? Yeah, her and some friends said, oh, no, we really like that. You know, it's got sort of, you know, you, you have so... The, the one thing I would say for them is you have so little time spending with these characters actually enjoying themselves or, 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 or relaxed that, uh, you know, it might be nice to just sort of hang with them for a bit. Yeah, also that, that poker trick is something um, I do regularly and take great delight in doing. And you have yourself fallen for it probably half a dozen times. I hate it. I think I've beaten you and then you throw in the other two cards and it's... You don't understand what's going wrong. It's like, it's like your world capsizes. It's a really smug, unpleasant thing to do. I've got to fun. add here, my wife spoke to uh, John Sim, who is the husband of Kate McGowan, and my wife saw him at a screening, and she said, oh, gosh, I bet that was quite awful, seeing Kate getting shot and falling in the river. And he said, no, I didn't have any problem with that. It was just that Scottish bloke snogging my wife. Oh, really? That gave me the hump. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I didn't have a good cope. I couldn't, yeah. I, I wouldn't, yeah. And here we have the Eiger, this actual picture I, I took. I took that photo from Kleiner Scheidig. I have been on that summit a few weeks ago, not via that North Face route, but by the Eastern Ridge. Uh, more about that in the extras, guys. So, yeah, OK, like, I think, you know, if this scene, honestly... Um, could have, you know, I like this, but I really like this bit where it gets more darker and serious. I feel more relaxed in the cinema watching this. 
I don't, you know. But there's also that actually sometimes you just watch something a hundred times and you, you do actually other people's opinions on it. I would have cut this scene probably right down, so would you, but I don't know. Who knows? Uh, this bit, I remember you wanted to cut because this was completely improvisation, but I felt it was quite naturalistic. Oh, what, the gist? Yeah, I wanted to cut, yeah. But you know what? It's nice to see Alison smiling, looking natural and looking relaxed. That's pretty much the last time in the movie that she's going to be having any sort of fun. These yeah. shots were done in August. Uh, that's looking down at Torridon from the north. Uh, right, folks, this, and now we're cutting back to May or June here. Um, yeah, we, uh, did, we did like a week of pickups in August. We shot the film. That was so much fun going back in August and just getting basically you and I and Ali and that. Well, we were just able to explore the whole of the west coast of Scotland, yeah, really, weren't very, we? It's very beautiful. Marred only by the midge in August, which is just. With a, with, I mean, you couldn't do a film, probably, or I certainly, I think you'd have a tough time getting actors to do long dialogue scenes with the midge as it was in August. Well, they did it in The Eagle, which I've just watched, and I really did liked. Really, 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 really underrated film, but they had so much wind that if you've got wind, that yeah. the midges can't land on you. But, I mean... But they are they are life-ruining, miserable creatures. Um, they do, yeah, they do really... I think the scene is really nicely photographed. I You know, there's nothing clever about it. It's just the lens choices and just the sort of... I, th I also really like our sort of multicoloured cast. I think it really works. I always sort of thought... Tally tallies. Well, they were a bit sort of colour-coordinated, blue, orange, red. But, I mean, if you go to the Alps or the Highlands or whatever, I'm afraid everyone is blue, orange, red, purple, what have you. I mean, you know, everyone... You know, and, and of course, wearing bright colours. I mean, I remember Alec Newman said, well, I really don't want to wear orange. And I showed him some video footage of Richard Bentley, who ended up being his double. I showed him some footage of him climbing. I said, well, look, he's a member of Mountain Rescue. Why on earth do you think a guide like you, who's probably a member of our Mountain Rescue, why do you think orange would be a good colour? And he was like, yeah, oh, I see. Like, yeah, and I said, absolutely, it's for helicopter, for everything, you know. This is, uh, I wrote this whole sort of sandwich bit. This is based, uh, I guess, on, on how I've, if somebody, if I'd spent all day walking, they probably walked about 10 miles. If I'd done that all day and somebody offered me a smoked mackerel egg sandwich, I'd lose my shit. I wouldn't be happy. No, I, 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 no I'm not with the smoked mackerel. It's not really my cup of tea. I spoke, I went, I took some friends to see it on Friday night and we actually spoke about that. They are all like, oh, I'd love a smoked mackerel egg sandwich. I was like, no, no, no. <laughs> it doesn't work for me. That's not actually the view that Melissa would have been seeing from there. Yeah, see, like, this is a really good location. This, again, is on the estate. And what I really like about... The road, isn't it? What's perfect about this location, just have a look at it there, Wills, is the separation from the trees. There's a lot of pine forests up there where the pine pine trees are too Incredibly close together. Dense, yeah, and you don't so get it's any so light. dark, you get no light at all. And, the, and the, It's um, actually quite creepy. There was one quite near here I used to go running through, and it's actually really creepy. It's just like, it's like the dark as night, and it's horrible. You went off and filled in a bit of this with second unit. In hindsight, you know, someone going for a pee is, a, is, is not, I don't think, my ideal way of him discovering it. Maybe he could have gone to get some water or something, I don't know. But Well, you've got a problem with urination as a sort of means of discovery. <laughs> Those are just digital zooms, aren't they, into statics? Yeah, that's the quite nice thing about red is you shoot essentially at 4K and then you project at 2K, so you do have... Uh, a bit of room to move into the image if you need to. So you can create digital zooms or punch in a little bit and stuff like that, and it's still sort of acceptable quality. I like the sound design here as well. I, uh, this part of the sort of movie, you're now having to create the, the discovery, and this was very early on, this was our sort of first couple of days of filming, and I, I sort of figured this is the scene that the film sort of pretty much stands and falls by. And I think I think this scene has, has come out incredibly well. I think in the script, what's kind of interesting is you wrote a lot of this particular scene, and then I was storyboarding this scene a long time later. And I think in the script, you said, you know, Ed shouts, I hear a noise. And then I think you write, Alison walks over and sees a tube jutting out of the ground. And I suppose a bit like, you know, with the Wild Bunch, where he creates the walk. You know, at the yeah, end. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, let's I, go. I, I figured that I needed my let's go walk bit and I needed a sort of a journey. So this bit coming up now, I wanted to create more visually interesting and sort of a scary, elongated out discovery of her finding the, the, the grave. The grave at Angel's Peak, which is what we were going to call it. Yeah, but people are all funny about that because Melissa George played Angel in, in Home, Home and Away and people were making quips about Angel's Peaks. Yeah, you oh, know, yeah. we belong together, you and I, forever and ever. Yeah, so that was a bit, also just wasn't... I like that, I put the sound design there, ages later, of the 
of the pheasant flying off because I was like, you know. You know, there was a, uh, a film in Fright Fest uh, uh, called A Horrible Way to Die. It was in Fantasia as well. Oh, was it? There's Apparently, it's not very similar, though. There's one that came out in 2009 called A Lonely Place of Dying, I think. Or a lonely, lonely Place for Dying. For yeah. Dying, yeah. So. I think it's quite a sort of Alistair MacLean title. I think it's quite a sort of 70s title, actually. Yeah. Um, again, this sort of part of the movie here, I really, you know, created this walk and had them sort of cautiously following Melissa from behind and I think it, it, it it's I'm really proud of how I sort of photographed this but I remember Scott was getting quite worried because with all these camera setups we were sort of going over schedule and I said but Scott once they start digging up the grave so I'm going to switch to handheld I'm going to change the style once it starts becoming you know quite unnerving and quite you know we, we almost want to be completely like god knows what's going to happen next so still here we're keeping the movement very fluid and graceful at this stage here you know you've got Ali's crane there that's cool I like that sort of looking up but there's a lot of stuff yeah um beautiful light look at that just stunning light I think that, I think that blue top really suits Melissa as well but that's the other thing, obviously, filming in the woods, you know, the, the, the sun's moving absolutely everywhere, the light's in and out. I think it's a really good job by um, the grader, Tim, to actually sort of keep everything matching. Some stuff shot on separate days and... Yeah. What the hell is that? Do you know what? It was really good performances, this scene, all round, actually. I think Gary's sweet. Now, here, you see, it's our first handheld shot here, but it's a gentle one. And now we start to get a bit more And I, I think I sort of... Um, don't leave anything behind, you know, pack light, he says at the beginning, doesn't he? And he takes two fold-up spades. This is... <laughs> well, you wrote the two fold-up spades, but I mean, I? I mean, you know, you could have had them digging with a helmet or whatever else, but, you know... Uh... But I never even thought of that until I was watching the other day, and I was like, why do they have two fold-up spades? Well, I'll tell you, in winter it's very, very common, although people usually use an ice axe, because you can dig a hole, you know, to, to sleep in. Fair enough. The, the art department did a really good job here as well. They didn't want to make it look too ancient, like, I don't know, a tomb of Raiders of the Lost Art. They wanted to make it look like the chamber was literally constructed very crudely and was obviously bought with just horrible chipboard from a big sort of DIY centre and that, you know, which, you know, was sort of quite, you know, and, and that horrible sort of uh, air pipe was just some old bit of gush. Yeah, that was actually really cool. And, um... And this is me with a 10 mil lens, the POV shot. That's not me there. That's that's Holly Boyd. Who is Scottish? Not Serbian, unless you did it. Now you know accent. what? Looking at their shot again, and nobody's questioned it, but I will. If they'd actually opened that box, she would be blind as a bat for 30 seconds. You know, she'd yeah. be blinking well, so and blinking. If, if you want to talk logic, actually, looking back at it, these big chipboard sides, we should yeah. have had slats. You got to think of these two guys dragging the six foot pieces of chipboard through the. Highlands, do you know what I mean? That's a very good point, actually. Or just bringing slats in bags, you know. I think it should have been slats in mud, looking back at it. But I only had that sort of idea. Our other challenge here was not to make her look like the ring. Oh, hold on, look, there, that owl. That owl is not a creature we hired. That owl was actually watching us filming on a completely different day. But the lights seemed to match perfectly, and we had these shots of Alec Newman sort of looking around the place. And I remember you were editing this scene, and I said, put the owl in. And you put it in and it worked beautifully. We tried putting two shots of the owl in, it was too much. As if to say, well, yeah, but it is it's a great bit of a sort of thin red line moment, cut to a bit of nature. Where there's so much nature throughout this film as well, you know, a lot of it being midges and insects and butterflies. I think this is Kate McGowan's standout moment in the film, actually. I mean, Kate came into audition at the flat just up the road. And she was auditioning to a candle. And she was just so brilliant, you know. I mean, she was just really, really convincing. And, uh, you know, one that won the part absolutely there and then. Well, she's a mum as well, so I think that sort of helps. Well, yeah, but, I mean, she's an actress. No, no so, I know, know, but it's got, it's got a, you know, it must mean something. Yeah, I think she's got a really, really... And also, you know, from a point of view of our writing, you know, we wanted Jenny to be the natural mum, and then, of course, we're going to get rid of the natural mum, and Alex, the top climber, we're going to get rid of him. Holly's brilliant here. Every, you know, there hasn't been a single review that's that singled out Holly for wrecking the film by being a wooden... But alternative, I haven't read a lot of, you know, a lot of people um, could have said, I, I think she's very good in it, actually. And it's quite, you know, it's quite a sort of, because if you read the script, the, obviously the, uh, the um, Anna character's there a lot, but she obviously doesn't really say anything. So we had to sort of get uh, in touch with the, some people and get lines translated to Serbian, and then she had to learn them phonetically and learn the accent and stuff like that. So, I mean, she worked pretty hard. 
And she was only how old was she? Nine, ten? No, she was ten. And then, yeah, I think this is the first thing. Is this the first thing she's done? No, this is... You understand what she's saying? No. It's just the accent sounds familiar. Now, you had an idea for a different line here. I can't remember I what it was. was it, I, think I, said, I think it was originally, I can say, spit roast or something. Was it something like that? You know what? Yeah, that would have just been, just, or, I think, just a wee bit too crude, you know? Or, or it was, he, he says, like, Shlannik, and there's subtitles, spit roast, and then you see Anna's face. <laughs> incredibly shocked. But that obviously would have been a shit idea. So <laughs> that would have been a really crap In fact, I was joking, that wasn't really, but it was originally going to be, I can say, spit roast, but I think... Um, maybe that might have been too far. Look at the light in that shot behind Kate. It's amazing. Uh, yeah, that would have been a rubbish idea. Yeah, um, it would pretty have just, poor. Pretty it would have poor. just been a bit crude, wouldn't it? It would just been, you know, and actually, now I love, that was the other thing you and I battled over in the script stage was the logic. We needed to create a map that made the logical reason why can't you all go down to Anne and Moore together why, you know, how do we get to Devil's Drop? How do we get to this exciting sequence? You know, this film has to be based in logic. It has to, you know, so, so of course, we create the map and look, the easy terrain is the long walk around, which is nearly always the case with mountaineering, is that the short route is the dangerous route. And in this case, a huge abseil down Devil's Drop. But the tiniest mistake in there, although it's, it's great, uh, is the audience survey map. He goes, we're here and there's no trees around it. But that's why we cut the first edit out. But yeah. that's true. You're, you're absolutely Someone right. Someone else pointed that out months after we found uh, it. But actually, you see that devil's drop there? That's not that's not vertical on a the map there. That that just looks like a steep gradient of about 45 degrees. So. Yeah, but it sells it. I, I sort of visually, you get that from that. I think. Yeah. I'm not an audience survey map expert. Incidentally, it was uh, Bruce Blagden who was our climbing technical advisor on set he was the one that said you know we always use a blade of grass usually when we're pointing at the map you know and, and that was just something i wouldn't have thought of but it's just again just with alec with the grass there it's just another little touch that makes him look like a seasoned veteran of mountaineering you know and i like the fact ed here is trying to be helpful he's not dropping sarky comments already you can see he's grasped the seriousness of the situation you know we like to sort of sort of say that ed was a, you know he was a twat he wasn't a complete you know. Sorry, you're talking about the character right now, don't you? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Ed, the character's Ed's called Ed. Guy. Sorry, the character's called Ed. I love this. It's and a helicopter yeah, shot that you directed. Yeah, we did. We did also did. We sort of did a day of helicoptering on the west coast for the sort of opening scene, and we also did a day of helicoptering all around the Scatwell Estate, and that's basically where we knocked off all our aerials in one day. Yeah. And I threw up in the helicopter because it's very, very sick, mate. Uh, being in there looking at a monitor whilst just sort of you can't feel your stomach because you're moving backwards and forwards and resetting. If any of you climbers quite, can't quite understand the buttress there, that's because the shot was flipped. Was it? Yep, it was. Now here we are on three different parts of, well, that's somewhere else entirely. That's Cory Shallot Gorge, is the actual. Gorge yeah, this is, this of the is water. essentially two, three, four locations uh, yeah. matching in for one. There's a location the actors can abseil down, there's a location for the Haston Step where Melissa gets yeah. stuck on. There's a location. Yeah, at least he throws that off a short cliff. There's the That's wide a location. Cliff, uh, there's the bottom location. location. There. And it's logistically impossible because this place we just couldn't find uh, somewhere that sort of fit all the criteria of what we needed to happen in the scene. And also originally you were planning to, you wrote this, there was a storm. Oh, this, yeah. That hit, which would have been really good as she gets stuck on the ledge, the storm hits. You need to get lucky raining. with bad weather. If you're going to make a storm look convincing, you want minimal CG, so you want it to be cloudy and miserable anyway. And the weather was so beautiful, it was never going to happen on our schedule. And you'd need a green screen machine. there. Yeah, that's actually something. Uh, yeah, a lot of people said it's nice to see, um, you know, very little green screen work. And I, I, I'm a big fan of, you know, I think green screen. I think that's done really well. Though. I think that's actually pretty much flawless. Well, it's because it's so handheld. Big, 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 as well, big, you big know. Um, very well done to the visual effects artists because that's some of the best green screen work I can think of. Because I see a lot of sort of green screen. I think well. is actually pretty crappy, which is um, often people driving in cars. Can just look really bad. I won't. I, I'm not at that now. Here we've actually digitally taken out Melissa's safety rope, but this stuff here was one of her first takes. Uh, one of her first takes early on, and uh, this was Melissa. She didn't quite. And now, it, all of her panic here. She's not having fun here. 
She's yeah, because yeah, climbing rope essentially is dynamic, so it has a lot of stretch in it. So sometimes when someone lets you down, you, you think you're going to fall, and actually yeah. you'll go down about half a foot. And so she she screeched and lost her temper with the the, 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 the climbing guy because uh, she was like, why can't you keep me on a tight rope? But it was as tight as it would go, but it naturally no, but it has is. stretch. I've, I've freaked out like that. Yes, it does. Yes, yeah, dynamic rope. So if you fall and you take a, you take a fall on it, it doesn't basically pull you in half and wreck your insides. Which is exactly you know how you want it. But yeah. I think probably if you had the budget, you'd actually be lowering it down a very thin wire, which is probably much easier to computer generator out because painting out that safety rope took a hell of a long time a lot of effort yeah because her arm sort of passes over it and stuff like that it's actually quite complicated so yeah all these shots so that's green screen and the rope painted out yeah of course she's on a top rope yeah i love that shot bang nice sort of economical editing there there you go chris chris Dumb. newton stunt doubling him Who's in Rise of the Foot Soldier? That's such a cool location, that Haston stuff. Now, that there, I love that. As you said, it looks like Jurassic Park or something. Pine trees yeah, growing out the, the side of world, cliffs. Yeah. yeah, you get you just need some dinosaurs and the scene will be even better. Yeah. That's right, she's, uh, she's making that here. This, this makes the audience jump. Digitally built up the cliff there. That's just great. That's obviously. And then this is a dummy, isn't it? Yeah, which we sort of corrected a bit digitally as well. Yeah, it had sort of enormous, stupid-looking white hands and white ankles when the trousers got pulled up. It's a bit stupid, so we had them play I with I love that. that shot at the butterfly. This next scene coming up is, uh, you know, we're talking much more sort of technically than we are about the story, but I'm afraid we, we've, I suppose, because we've been through the story so long. But here again, just technically, this, this location here, it just lent itself to just having a really long dolly track and putting the lenses on different sizes and then it just it, it's a beautifully photographed scene this again i don't want that sort of grubby you know miserable what's the word that people like to use gritty and no. actually it's quite nice nobody seems to have mentioned that this film is gritty and i'm, I'm rather glad about that because visually it's not visually it's really quite sumptuous and that was a very deliberate sort of yeah, but I mean, I don't, yeah, I, don't, I don't think it's a sort of the landscape for grainy super handheld 16 mil potentially Wow, yeah, maybe. But that was, yeah, that was quite, um, that location's literally just at the side of the track, isn't it? And we called that scene we just done Devil's Drop Part 1, and now we cut back into Devil's Drop Part 2. So is that two. flipped as well? No, that's not. Right. And so there you go. I almost think that shot there looks green screen because it's so ND filtered, but it's not. That's completely real. That's an effect shot there. Yeah, it is. It's a forward and a background element that they're actually other. focus pulling between all they've really done here though is just take a safety rope out you know and and the odd sort of path in the background on the other side of the valley that yeah there was too... loads of stuff in the background like paths and white there fences. i just want to say we've built up the top of the cliff there as well and that's belinda with us now that's actually melissa but again you can't quite see her face it's a little bit wasted because you'd think that's a stunt double there i love this shot because in the same shot her foot slipped and you can clearly see it's Melissa and not a double. Yeah, so again, yeah, that's just sort of basically... Uh, Great green screen there. And that's you a few months later dropping a bit of polystyrene onto me or whatever it was, yeah, foam like rocks. Yeah, foam rocks, yeah. No, that's that is not a foam rock. That's a great big... Rock Remember actually one of the first times we shot for the, when we were shooting, um, the actual rock that was supposed to knock her off, it hit her straight on the head. And everyone was like, foam okay. rock. Yeah, the yeah. foam rock. And it was like, okay, cut, let's move on. And then someone was like, no, 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 no. If a rock hits you on the head... You're dead. I love his build-up of the score here. That's good tracking, that. It's very hard to do. What, sorry? Tracking with the, the shot like that. Oh, well, actually yeah. panning, oh, panning yeah. the camera with it, yeah. We needed that POV shot of her spinning or we just couldn't make the cuts work, could we? No, that was done months later. And this is Belinda being lowered on a sort of a rig. And, you know, there's so many different stunts. Just It's quite old-school editing and cutting that together but it's actually it just works really really well melissa's fall i think it's one of the highlights of the film into yeah, cutting i think it's here nice between... i think that actually the shot looking down the sort of shot looking down where she's going into the river and it's actually a green screen background it really sells it well yeah now this is this is not in a tank in essex that's actually up in scotland and this is jamie with the 5d yeah it's just shot on a canon 5d just with that sort of those sort of surface level shots canon 5d with a little underwater housing which is i really... love these shots here i love this pov i put there shot from a boat i love the foreground ash just in the foreground i love the sort of foregrounds and 
really sort of creating a dimension by putting things in the foreground. I, I think that shot right there would have worked even better with a bit of greenery in like that. Do you see that? That to me, that is that foreground shallow. Now that's that shot there is a ten mil. That, that it's works really very well, well, isn't it? But look at those locations. Again, this is no way near the cliff where she was, you know, doing her climb. This is about 150 miles further north, east. Yeah. Dream scene, uh, initially probably creepier and even more horror-like. She actually sort of, there's somebody else in there with her. That was right. She hears a noise behind her. And there's her. something clearly in the in the thing with her. And then this sort of horrendous, creepy-looking Anna sort of goes towards her, almost like the sort of the grudge style, and then it cuts and she wakes up. But I think Melissa was very, very anti, making it quite, I suppose, you know, quite generically horror. horror. Yeah. And I suppose, you know, at the end of the day, maybe it is a better choice to just play it on claustrophobia. At least then you're playing... I think it's probably scarier, the concept of actually being in there, you know, alone. I like the sound design there as well. But you, you would have had a huge jump moment there, but I don't know, would it have been keeping in the rest of the film? I don't know. No, I don't. I think it would have been a bit of a cheat. I feel a bit supernatural. I think it would be a bit of a cheat, you know... I think, yeah, I don't think you could introduce zombies or equipment no, I like the film now. This bit here, when I was at Fantasia, there was a cinema full of 600 people in Toronto, uh, Montreal. And the moment she woke up there, there was a gasp from the audience, and then everybody in the audience started clapping. They just thought it was a great fake-out, as they call it over there. Yeah, there's a couple, actually, in the film. There's obviously the thing with the hunters as well. I, like that. I really like the scene where she sort of slowly comes to, and I remember speaking to Michael about the music I didn't just want it to be, I wanted it to sort of be the sort of the rebirth of if you like I don't know I guess the sort of the birth of the action Alison you know that's almost the death of the first half Alison or the first third Alison and now this new character sort of rises rises up and he's got that really dramatic music to go with it look at those locations no it's fantastic that river originally we thought it would be actually some of it it's just the sides are so steep it'd just be impossible to film down but we end up just sort of roping down the side of it and crossing yeah, initially it we thought it was too too much and that's why we were going to go for a more tame river by Rogi Falls and right, had, that, that one had a really cool waterfall though that was the only thing but yeah. this had way better sides look at the sides yeah. there and stuff and then I actually said and I think you were totally right but I said do we have to have the line it's been cut doesn't necessarily look it's been cut there at all. No, I know, but you do. It's like, I was sort of thinking it's like Evil Dead too. Well, I think I was going to mention here, look at that there. You see the silver birch trees there in the wind and also there in the wind looking up at the cliff. So it's two different locations, but it's windy in both, same types of trees in both, and it just links in so nicely with the edit, you know? I find all found that shot a little bit flat after the previous one. What do you mean? It's just the, the one previously, just there's this much more to it in the sense of sort of shape of mountains and stuff like that, and I find the next shot a bit flat. But that's just me. So here come our, our hunters, and we kind of, uh, you know, we auditioned. There were a lot of really good Scottish actors that came in for this. And uh, Dougie there was in Ned's, actually. As a very, was he? Yeah, Ned's is a brilliant film. It's a brilliant Anyone who hasn't seen Ned's, go and see it. You will not be disappointed. It is a brilliant film. Stephen McCall's in and it who as does, well. Who does he play in it, Dougie? He plays a policeman in it. So it's, again, a bit of your second unit aerials. And Holly had been doing night shoots so that's actually Holly's little sister there yeah doubling her I was actually sort of worried that there were obviously all doubles there even filming them from the helicopter I was worried like oh people are going to notice but <sighs> yeah I guess that's a lesson I learned you get away with so much get away with anything yeah I mean yeah. within yeah. yeah and this is sort of you wrote this scene didn't you I, yeah I this is based on they're talking about spirit drink this is based on something we used to buy at school which is a specific brand of vodka that was so yeah, cheap obviously they called it spirit drink and it was absolutely filthy and I've never drunk it since and I don't advise any of you guys listen to this too either no you know what you don't, you don't economise on stuff like that have a, have a nice gin and tonic you know, well, I'm advising our yeah. 15 year old viewers to but, uh, drink gin and tonic uh, remember, I mean you know <laughs> drink responsibly Drink responsibly. If you're going to have a gin and tonic, have it, you know, early in the evening. Don't drink gin at two or three in the morning, because then, then you're really, really yeah, looking right, for okay. suicide. Let's suicide get back. Let's get back on day. point. Let's get back on point. Back on point. Right. The introduction of our two uh, main villains, who I think we've we've possibly created a couple of 2011's most spiteful creatures on screen. Actually, yeah, they're not. They're sort of. There isn't really that grey area. You know, a lot of characters are a lot of bad people. They're, I mean, they they really are. Genuinely, you've got to give them habit. They're single minded. 
Single-minded. And I like this as well, you know, because obviously I think that the hunters look almost more chiselled and grizzled than our two villains, but you realise quite quickly. But yeah, I wonder if anyone actually watched this and thought... Um, and these, we were, these we guys were rushed are just for time on this, weren't I think we? if you cast Sean, you know that, you know, obviously he's the face coming in here. They're not going to sort of fall for that trick and think, or maybe some people did, that would be cool. This is digital blood coming in when he's stabbed in the throat because uh, we had a machine that was just wasting time. And it's one of those days where it was raining. It was a miserable day. It was absolutely horrible. The rain came in and out. It was just, yeah, but slowed actually, everything down. But actually, what we've really done is really, I think, with, with, with the weather and cutting some bad weather, you did a few second unit shots like that. Yeah, yeah. That, sells it a bit more. Um, you can do the, the rest of the sound. sound design they've done. Even in the background there, a bit of digital... Behind our hunter, who's pleading for his life, please, you saw please, very nice green fields yeah, there, in the there background. Were patches, there? It looked too manicured, so we digitally made it look in the middle of nowhere. There like was that. a lot of that sort of stuff, just little things in the background that just telegraph was, poles, yeah. pylons, that kind. Of, they would have had to do that in the Lord of the Rings and all sorts of stuff as well, you know, where you just you want to make it look as wild as you can. This has ended up coming out a lot better than it did originally. It's just such a nightmare trying to get that that sort of. Uh, it's that out of focus shot of him landing that worked in the end. It's a little bit of dummy work there. And then, um, yeah, nice some, people, some people, a couple of people actually didn't quite get who the hunters were. And I think that, that deer shot obviously is explaining they were out there looking for deer. Basically, it was a, it was a red herring. They yeah, were out there. Some, some people generally didn't get that. You could just cut them out and just have these two hunters armed with rifles. But wh wh why can't we have a bit of fun with the genre that we're in? I mean, look at Psycho, for God's sake. I mean, the first 25 minutes of that movie is about a woman stealing money and trying to get away with it. And you suddenly realise that's not the story. So, they leave. We come in with an aerial shot here and bring in a couple of, well, three new characters. Um, you know, some people complained that they wanted to keep the story very simple, just basically, you know, some, some critics, uh, especially in the UK side, wanted it just to be ultimately about the two guys hunting down the climbers. That was never going to be enough for you and I. No, I think it's fun to bring a new, a new crew of people, certainly. Especially at this sort of point, uh, juncture of the movie. Obviously, if there's, you know, two villains and then these other characters are coming in, clearly there's a bigger story at stake. Great second unit shots done by you there up the river with a double there for Melissa and now cutting to Melissa weeks earlier. Yeah, I remember the, the, the double who was actually doubling in for that. I think it was Very important to have Kate down by the water there. If you're going to kill her, there's a reason why she needs to be at the edge of the water. Just from a point of view, if she wasn't gathering water there for her thing, why would she be right at the edge precariously, you know? Is that something you figured out on the day? or? No, no, something that I figured out age in the storyboarding. Well done. Well, she, I suppose she could have fallen down a rock and... I think in the original script, her head came apart and you were like, no, I don't want to do that. Well, it blew People, up like people, a sort of melon, <laughs> like a watermelon. Like, um, I was thinking like the proposition. Uh, there's, there's, there's someone getting shot in the head in that, which is pretty shocking. In reality, they could hear each other quite clearly over this river, so we sound designed a lot of the sort of loudness of the river. Oh, yeah, the, yeah, that's, it's really not actually sort of very dangerous or rough. You could probably wade, well, you, you could wade across that easily. Yeah, well, still. But, no, but you're trying, to, you're trying to sell it a bit. Yeah, so you've got to ham it up a bit. Now this shot coming up, that's digital, the background there, that huge waterfall wasn't there, but that does show that it's responsible for the... The sort of volume of water and the noise yeah, and that's actually quite, yeah. shallow. I think you tell you get away with it, that, that, I think that, that works, the sort of sense that, that there's a real sort of distance between them, they can't hear each other. I love this bit. I think Kate's face betrays a real truth. There. And do you want to talk, someone actually I read online quite uh, accurately guessed what your inspiration for this moment was. Uh, well, it was two of my friends. Uh, oh, was it? It was Mark Jobson and uh, Sh uh, and uh, Shane Dobby, and yeah, my inspiration here was 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 Conan the Barbarian when Conan's mother has her head chopped off off screen, the head falls forward, and then Conan's mother. I'm talking about the original Arnold Schwarzenegger film, by the way, and then Conan's mother just falls away like this. Yeah, that's right. You know, but then we've had our own thing here, which is bang! Suddenly, we kick it into the peril that you know drags her into the river. And yet. Oh, an interviewer asked me the other day, he said that is some of the best use of a dummy he'd ever seen in a river. And I said, well, there isn't a dummy in the river. I said, no, it's, um, it's, um, that's Belinda, Belinda is doubling Kate McGowan. And it's kind of scary. Thinking, who's doubling the little girl again? Uh, Tina Fey, no, no, Cecily Tina Fey. Tina Fey, yeah, the girl does 30 Rock. Yeah. No, not... She came, She quit 30 Rock for the week and came down to work <laughs> No, there's Tina Fey going down yeah, there. That's no, Cecily, Cecily Fey, yeah. Um, who's, uh, yeah, who doubled all of uh, uh, Holly's stuff. 
Oh, I love this bit here. Now, that is not a dummy. That is uh, Belinda, who is actually, most of the time, Melissa's stuff. That double. is quite scary. They think her head's smashing on the bum. I mean, she must have had some sort of protection on, but, I mean, because she's obviously blonde hair, so she's got a wig there, but it's quite scary. I mean, I wouldn't, certainly wouldn't be doing it myself. I love these wide-angle shots there. A lot of people have been very... I think the sound design of the bullets whizzing and everything. We spent a long time doing that. And this shot here that you shot, I really wanted to add the... Yeah, this is just me running along the side with the 5D. And I've actually looked... There's a, no, it's not here. It's actually in a bit where you can see Gary Sweeney is just running along and he comes just a bit too close to the edge. They actually said after that take, whoa, I'll point it out here. He just comes Ooh, quite close yeah, to the does, edge yeah. there. Now, this bit coming up here, 60 feet. that stunt has just come out incredibly. That's obviously cutting to the underwater uh, studio in Essex. But that, that, that stunt, Melissa, uh, not Melissa, Belinda, who did the stunt, uh, she did that stunt where she wasn't going to hurt herself and she was just going to fly through the air. The rucksack was going to explode and then she was going to do another take where she was going to rip the skin off her arms, make it really gritty and real. I said, the gritty real one will just look grubbier. It won't sure look as dramatic herself. and she'll really hurt herself and possibly be off the show. So I might have done her out of a sort of a, a more expensive stunt, but the one which sure, she didn't sure, get yeah. harmed was better. And the other thing is that we did do an initial take where they put a squib on the... Uh, rucksack and it just sort of went and just dropped out and it didn't look very good so the second time yeah it, it looks it looks like she i mean it looks good but it's sort of realistic it's like she had a smoke bomb well no it looks a like she's an international canister. cocaine smuggler and yeah. a kilo of cocaine exploded out of her rucksack Ke cocaine kept in a high pressure so the cylinder they get shot like we were told not to talk about drugs okay um <laughs> obviously movie wise now this uh here is a mixture of uh this is a, a very good friend of mine and a stunt woman called Joe McLaren, who's doubling uh, her. I can't get her names out. Kate, Kate McGann. McGann. And that's Kate McGann up in Scotland. Now here we are back in Essex, and that's uh... now that shot here. This shot here is underwater in the waterfall. That's not colour corrected. That's the actual colour of the water. Yeah, it's the peat. And an American totally reviewer yellow. said, yeah, that the river was really filthy. It's not. It's the sign of incredibly clear, clean, uh, good water. In parts of Scotland, it's the peat, the brownness of the yeah, peat. Yeah, it's, it's a bit freaky though when you run your first bath and you're like, this is yellow, seriously. Yeah. Um, but then you get over that and apparently, it makes it, apparently that's cleaner. Yeah. I'm not drinking it though. No, it's very, very good for your hair as well. Everyone, everyone's hair looks naturally conditioned. Well, I noticed that. Yeah. This is intercut between underwater in Essex like there and actual sort of underwater footage. God, that pool, it's an amazing location, isn't it? It's Melissa enjoying the uh, Freezing Scottish cold water. water. No, she wasn't having much fun there. I, yeah, I think it is pretty cool. Though. It's very nicely intercut here. What I'd like to say is it's not super fast cut, and I really don't, you know, because there's a lot of movement and there's a lot of stuff going on, and, you know, as the stunt people did such a good job, I don't just want to be cut, 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 or pushing in so tight, you can't see anything that's actually going yeah, on. Yeah, you lose your sense of spatial awareness. I can't believe my phone just went off there. I do Sorry think that's that. a sackable offence. Yeah, possibly. Okay, ladies and gents, Jules will be stepping out for the rest of the commentary. Um, now, you saw a jump cut there. That's because uh, that was a different day, and Melissa was absolutely adamant she wasn't going back in the river. So I just thought, you know what, I'm just going to do a jump cut. And yeah. sometimes jump cuts just work. But also, is it that fine. interesting having another 30 seconds of her clambering out? Well, you could have had rocks. five seconds of her clambering out, but, you know, if she doesn't want to do it, she doesn't want to do it. Um, this scene here... It's important to point out that, you know, when he scored it, I didn't want it to be scored in a sentimental way. I wanted it in a way that, uh, you know, it was sad and then actually, right, get on with it, right? Okay, there's a job to do. There's no point being emotional. You've got to get this child breathing again. And that was something that I wrote in a sort of a later draft. It wasn't originally there. I suddenly thought there's a real room to make it really dramatic if the child's down underwater for too long. And it's like... Her uh, face is really good. And I think Melissa's just brilliant. Yeah. I think she's just acted it really purely. This particular scene, out of all the scenes, we didn't have the right geography here, so we didn't have enough wide shots No, they're here. literally like 20 feet across the river, aren't they? Sort of so this scene, to me, is a bit... It's a bit too broken into close-ups, which isn't... It's not intentional. Funnily enough, nobody sort of spots it. They just let it go on. But you, you, I remember I had to finish up, and you did a few second unit shots, and you needed more time, and I needed more time. I'd have liked another just another few hours on this scene but what did come out well in this scene was was Stephen McColl's casual loading and the nice look between the two of them 
And I remember uh, Sean didn't want to do the point. He said, oh, I don't need to do a point. That won't add anything. I think it's really good that he does that. It's a yeah, real it's moment. It's very menacing, isn't it? Yeah. Well, it's not in the script as well. We needed a moment between Sean and Melissa. And I thought that was a really good sort of... Uh, that's on a wire cam there, operated by yours truly. And that's uh, on a truck, operated by yours truly. Um... Yeah, here we go. Again, different location. It's really good, this. This is something that was storyboarded down to a T. I love this. Ali's idea here. You know, let's go and get a dolly. I said, we'll never get a dolly in time. He said, yeah, we will. And they set that up in five minutes. It's beautiful yeah, it's shot. Cool, isn't it? Yeah, beautiful shot. And then... This is your aerial shot. Look at the top top of the picture. There, you see the salmon jump? Rewind. Alex. Feeling great salmon jump. I love that, that little pool focus there. That was my idea. I really like it. It's so great that that aerial shot you just did of the two hunters. No, it looks nice. Yeah, we Epic. did it. We did it both ways up the river, sort of going downstream and upstream. And it was coming upstream, worked out like the best, coming over that tree. It looked cool. I love this. It's exactly how I storyboarded it. She was going to walk. Now my my influence for this shot here was John Voight in Deliverance, and he wakes up the next morning, and the guy with the shotgun is out of focus at the top of the cliff. You know, and that was sort of you know when he's got the bow and arrow and he has to get ready. And then we go in a different direction with this, but... Yeah, yeah someone I was with, I, took, I went to see that with some friends, they really jumped during that, which I thought was It's cool. quite a cheap jump, but it seems to work, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think Ed Spillers, by this stage, I think most people will be behind the character in the movie. I think this is. I think he's really, really good. I think he's got a, you know... And Stephen McColl is just so, so menacing here. Now, you know, again, I saw, funnily enough, it was in No Country for Old Men. There's a bit with a computer-generated bird, and you just think, if you're going to have a bird in a film, just have a yeah, bird. Yeah, it's a guy just lying down off-screen, isn't it? He Holding a partridge. He's got a couple of partridges in a cage, and he let the partridge let go. It go Once it? it was let it go, that was it. The partridge had escaped, and you'll never see it again. But A lot of these sort of distant bullet hits are actually put in afterwards. They're just, you know... Oh. Yeah, squibs, you never really bad. This is where it's out really well. You did nearly all of the second unit. Yeah. And I like, again, that shot was something that you really wanted no, to see. that was sort of, cool, yeah. And I like um, this sort of the POV shots as well, like uh, there. I always thought this looks really painful. I think everybody sells that. And it's actually shot at 21 frames rather than 24, so it's like a little bit faster. It just gives it a bit more oomph. Ch -ch Real change. Um, Melissa's change she's no longer the the girl with the blue jacket she's the girl with the black jacket our reasoning there that she lost her rucksack in the river so she'd obviously have taken something off gary sweeney gary who just had a lady's top for his yeah. wife yeah, okay okay yeah yeah fair enough we, we actually worked that. out let's not get bogged down in the movie where everyone changes their clothes the whole time but it is logical yeah it's not a spice girls concert sort of where they come out every new song with that yeah Again, this is shot a bit simpler than I storyboarded it, just their dialogue, but it seems to work. Gary, I think, is, is, is absolutely brilliant here. Yeah. I think, um, I mean, I, I think they all are. But I just, I love the fact that, you know, Gary really plays it. Yeah, is he, is he going to betray them? Is he just going to throw the girl out and run yeah. for it? Or is he going to step up and do the right thing? What do you reckon? Now, one thing that's interesting, this sequence coming up, which you... Edited. I did a lot of the editing of Big River action scene, but this end scene, you took the pressure off me. So, you, you know, you, you had a while to do this end scene. And what's interesting is that just watching that there, and just watching it for the first time, it hasn't even occurred to me that he's holding a fake girl. Somebody oh. said, how did they get a doll? But I'm like, no, 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 that's made up of camping mats. And, you know, like, you know, just he's just basically got a load of... I think maybe the shoes um, were a bit much, you know, it's got little sort of fake feet on it. Again, been... this was very much, now this was originally designed to be in a bluebell forest where the floor was completely purple. And, uh, and it would have been really cool. It would have looked a little bit manicured probably, but it would have looked really cool, just a floor of purple. But we would have had to go probably to England for that. And yeah, they hadn't come out yet, had they? Cause they no, come they out. had. They come out a month later no, in Scotland. Yeah, but they, they'd come out. There is actually a bluebell in this scene somewhere. Okay, brilliant. Uh, uh, yeah. We're what? Yeah, there. Okay, brilliant, yeah. There was a bluebell in the background. They didn't quite it's not exactly a carpeted sort of forest floor, though, is it? This is the bloodiest scene of the film. And actually, very late on, that bit where he got shot in the shoulder back there, I added a sort of a wet sound very late on. I thought, oh, God, I hope we don't get an 18 certificate for that. But um, 
you know, this was going to be the sort of the bloodiest yeah, bit no, of the movie. Definitely. Um, funnily well, enough, think, actually, think... probably quite influenced by a uh, Full Metal Jacket, actually, when the snipers taking out the guys. Uh, I saw some of that the other day and went, oh, I bet a bit of influence of that went into this. I really wanted that shot there. Initially, when you were editing it, you didn't, but I'd always got him to act. I'd always got Gary to act. I said, think of Kate McGowan, and you see he slightly smiles. It's a really nice edit you did there as he's falling, and you cut to the Yeah, that is a monstrous of sort of front and back squib on, on, on Gary. I also, Stephen credit, Cole's laugh, all credit yeah. to Gary. This location that day was just midge infested, and Gary just lay down in there all day being eaten alive, running he and running and running. He did not complain once, yeah. Gary Sweeney. He's an utter trooper. Him and Stephen McCall are some of the most also, talented this... actors in Scotland. And you know what? I think, I think you know, I think this film will, will bring them to light for, for a lot more people because, I mean, you know, I was watching Gary in the cinema when I was, like, you know, 20 at university, watching him, you know, in... Uh, Oh, Small that? faces. There you go. Yeah. Actually, you know, I've never seen that. It's really? brilliant film. Brilliant I should have watched that. Yeah, midges all over the place. There, yeah, you can that. see that there. That is actually. Um, they weren't that bad. That was only. Some no, they were. Gym. They were. You were trying to be sort of. I don't know if you were actually trying to be or you were tough about it, but I, I couldn't cope. I was having. They were seriously damaging my calm. Now, this shot here, it was your idea to use the um, dam, wasn't it? Yeah, they were just, otherwise they were just driving on the road, and you know it's just another shot of the car. Well, that dam was just there at the end of the uh, whatever it was called estate, and it just seemed like a perfect. So like a real waste not to use it. It was kind of cool that we had it there, and we could have done it. So yeah, it would have been a shame not to do it. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's just nice. To, anyway, we're learning a bit more about these characters as they're coming up to Scotland. Obviously, they've got an agenda at the moment. It's a little bit. Uh, I don't know what the word is, ambiguous, that's the word. A little bit of digital effects there on his little so device. His little, yeah, his GPS thing. I remember Carell did an earlier line and he went, I may as well wipe my ass on the girl if we can't find the money. <laughs> and he thought he'd done the line really well and there was like, no. <laughs> the only bit I don't like about this with Ed going down is a couple of shots back there where the rope looks tailed. You know, uh, you yeah, tails when you hold it from below and keep it tight. So if Ed slips, you just pull it tight and it stops. Yeah. But yeah, I know what you mean. I, I think it'd have to be... It's nice economical editing by here. We know, we've seen earlier in the film, we know how it works. And we did so have just... it. He was shouting like, safe and off belay. But then we realised, oh, as editing this, it was just like, um, no, if you're being pursued by kidnappers, it's probably best to try and be as quiet as possible and leave the climbing screams to sort of earlier on in the picture. This is one of the very later scenes that we wrote to the script. It wasn't in the first draft. And I thought it was a really sort of a nice moment of trust between Melissa, Alison, I should say, and Anna, who's played by Holly. Um, you know, I actually just, uh, when, when I was climbing with Bruce in the fairy caves down in Wiltshire, uh, I, I just thought, you know what, we need another moment, another bit, you know, just, you know, a final bit to rope off the mountain. And I thought that was a really nice sort of, where, where ultimately just a, a moment where she has to trust the new mother. You know, Jenny's gone. And now we have Melissa becoming the surrogate mother of the movie. It's okay, Anna, keep coming. Yeah, okay, fair enough. Oh, keep coming, steady, steady. Dubbed a little scream of Holly there over the stunt woman. Yeah, that's obviously that's Cecily again, dubbing Holly. Um, or Tina Fey, whichever one, I can't remember. No, it's Cecily Fey. Mark. <laughs> I love the, the the sort of rope. That's obviously, See, that's where, obviously that's not, not tailed. tailed. Yeah, yeah, that looks beautiful. So it looks really nice, that billowing part. Well, so I remember when we wrote the first draft of the script, we obviously didn't know that much about climbing then because you said, how can they abseil down the cliff and then get their rope? Well, as you can see, it's a loop abseil. So there were two yeah. bits of rope. So you basically, as you saw earlier at Devil's Drop, they just loop it round a, uh, yeah. a stake or a rock. But and then ultimately, once you're down the bottom, you pull one of the ropes and, you know, but Yeah, but fair enough. That, no, we were sort of doing logic police earlier on. When I first asked you that, you didn't have a solution to how it happened. But obviously, you know, there must be a way of doing it. Otherwise, how would climbers ever get anywhere? Well, yeah, because if you're abseiling down off the Eiger or wherever, to you, you've got to get your rope. You can't leave your rope, you know. Sometimes you have to bin gear, though. Sometimes if you're in very, very difficult situations climbing-wise and, you know, you've just got to get off the you mountain, you've got to yeah. get off alive, you've got to bin some expensive gear. But if it means you're going to get down, no, you just create anchors or whatever. But, I mean, it's, it's not that, you know, yeah, sort of usually five, six quid bit of gear or something. I mean, this was a scene you and I almost um denied about deleting. And everybody seems to like this scene because they like, but as I think this question was on a lot of people's lips. Well, no, why didn't you just You know, leave well, them? not why didn't we just leave them, but what if we had just maybe just walked away from this situation? 
And uh, I saw somebody on the IMDb saying the most unrealistic thing about this film is that they actually went to help the girl. And somebody else replied, well, I don't really agree with you because, like, leaving little girls in the ground isn't really the done thing to do, yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, I think, to be fair, though, you, yeah. No, I think that's a pretty good point. Ed is playing devil's advocate. He's not saying we should have. He's just saying, what do you think we could or should have done? Yeah, fair enough. Party involved? Police? He just seems very naturalistic, Ed, as well. He seems to really get this scene. You know, a lot of actors, when they came in for auditions, just couldn't get the tone of Ed. And I think the character of Ed, I keep saying Ed because we wrote the character of Ed long before Ed Spillers became Ed. No, that's your trademark. You always put a character called Ed somewhere in there. But I think West is a good name. Short, sharp, no nonsense. But I think, um, you know, he, you know, in the wrong hands, I think the character could have come across as incredibly obnoxious and unlikable. A lot of, yeah, a lot of his earlier dialogue is based on sort of stuff I've said, so yeah, quite understandably. And a lot of people across. think that the first time they meet you, you're quite obnoxious, obnoxious and unlikable. And unlikable. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, and they still think that like 15 times, you know, 15 meetings later, so that's, yeah. yeah. They need to sort of rein in my shtick. Here we are. Push for time here at the end of the day, so we did this all in one shot. With actors like this calibre here, you most definitely can do that. Just to finish off what I was saying, Ed brought a softness to the character of Ed as opposed to leaving him just obnoxious and irritating. Of course, real boo-hiss moment. You know, we got a Japanese kid that was eaten by rats. You were talking alive. about uh, sort of shooting like a, a shot of like a rat at a pipe there, weren't I you? I think that could have been really cool, but we'd have had to shoot this differently. You would have had to shoot this very differently. But I'd I'd have had to, I wouldn't have just shot it in that sort of slightly flat way. I think I think that's pretty... I just just thinking about it's bad enough. Just a know. shot of a Chinese boy screaming. Japanese. I beg your pardon. A shot of a Japanese boy screaming. And then a cut to no, that's rats that's coming horrible. down the pipe towards you. I don't want to see you. that. You don't want to see that. Just because it's not a, it's not this story, uh, and b it's just so horrific. Well, I suppose you're right, and also, I mean, you know, when I think got, it, when... actually, if you'd seen the kidnapping and transportation of Anna, I mean, I think that just just would be really hard. I think also, like you know, Robert Shaw doesn't need flashbacks of uh, you know the people getting massacred by the sharks in his Indianapolis story. He's just allowed to say it. This scene here, these aerials here with the ransom note, it's a very nice transition from one group of people into another, as opposed to just cut. We listen to the ransom demand, we realise it's a recording, and we've cut from you know Mr. Kid's voice with the green Land Rover to the silver Volvo, and our three. Characters also, here. this sequence is originally uh, this first bit of dialogue here was originally, uh, originally still meant to be driving, but it's, it's quite a pain in the arse shooting in oh, cars. And they they could, you guys couldn't get the car mount to work, and it is a real hassle. I don't sometimes. like those wide angle shots when you're sort of forced to sort of just sit in a car with a camera. Yeah, it, it starts making it look very kind of low budget. And as soon as you can get it static here and put longer lenses on and make it look a bit prettier, you know? Yeah, very good performance here by Eamon and Corral. And, uh, you know, I really like, you know, again, you know, I suppose there is a little bit of sort of politics here. You know, it's a bit sort of, you know, very dodgy sort of, you know, father figure to the little girl. We'll find out later that she lives with her mother, of course. And that the bad guys didn't do their homework. Behind everyone. I like what's happening here. I just like the fact that, you know, Andy, played by... Uh, Eamon Walker, he's really just preparing Carell. He's really sort of sitting there telling him what to do, what not to do. And Carell's not like some dumb shit character. He's, you know, he's a pretty clued also, up guy. the two mercenaries, sort of a little stupid practical joke on Andy and Chris. This is sort of play on Andy McNabb and Chris Ryan. Well, there you go. And obviously XSAS, which these guys probably would certainly be ex-special forces. Now, what's the line, um, Paul Anderson on the, on the outtakes or whatever? Because he doesn't have a line in the car and he says, you should see what I'm doing back here, it's a miracle. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, yeah. He, so he actually, they shot his shot last, so he had to sort of sit at the back while everyone else was doing everything all day. He's got a really good face, so he's, just, he's got menace to him, you know? And I think it's high time he broke out the guns. Absolutely. There we go. Chromed 45s. Uh, why we wanted chrome, of course, is that silver would pick up much better in the, in the darkness of the nighttime yeah. scenes. Again, you know, uh, I, I have no problem with this story becoming, you know, introducing more characters. I would have personally got bored if it had just been two goons chasing, you know, the remaining clients. You would have had to find out a lot more about Yeah, I, I like this. It turns into more of a sort of cluster, can I say cluster fuck? Yeah, it turns into a cluster bomb, maybe. I don't know. I don't think that's the same. I know, but the meaning. point is, I like the fact that it absolutely, it's, it's going to end in 
this is a late addition. This particular scene here was not in the script. I suddenly realised before we see them in yeah, the we town... Do. We, we need to get into the road, otherwise it's to... just too much of a transition. And also that, that car obviously there was just a, a silver Land Rover Discovery. But it does, it's a bit too similar to sort of um, maybe... A silver Volvo, people wonder whether that could... Yeah. I suppose it could have been Andy and Chris going into town. That would, yeah, they could have just bumped into each other and been like, oh, wow. And yeah. just skip the entire sort of Maybe we could road. have had a few more dissolves of them walking into town, but I reckon they see a road, you know, and now we go into the sort of the final third of the film. I, um, visually as well, what I really liked, uh, you know, American Review picked it up, was that a lonely place to die has nothing to do with location. It's often to do with the character themselves, you know, and, and in the most crowded place, if you're amongst strangers, it's the loneliest place to be. And this, this is based on the Beltane Fire Festival, which plays on Carlton Hill in Edinburgh every April 30th. That's and me, I, sorry, that's me. Way I look around there. Brilliant. Sorry. Awesome. And I, I, God, these costumes are just awesome. To yeah, me, this, this cool. really picks up now. This, you know, for me, I, I love this section of the movie. A lot of people have, have, have really, really liked this whole sort of police station being shot to shreds section of the movie. Uh, some people think that the film got overcooked at the end here and a bit jumbled yeah. up. I yeah. don't particularly think so at all. Uh, for me, it would never have been satisfying, like I said, if they just stayed in the hills and sort of used their Climbing, mountaineering... Says, yeah, I was thinking, like, use their know. mountaineering gear, because I, I was looking sort of as a joke to see what you, bits of mountaineering gear you could use to kill bad guys. Yeah, it's like, you oh, could, like could string... the carabiner as I. Yeah, you know. yeah, and there's, to be honest, there's not that much. Maybe you can hang someone with a rope. Oh, it's just, you know, I just didn't up. want, and I didn't want, you know, Sean Harris falling off Ben Nevis at the end in an Alan Rickman die-hard moment or whatever. You know, I wanted to see who, who, who the hell they were flipping blackmailing in the first place. And what I like is that, they, you know, they're not blackmailing somebody who's just going to bend over and take it up the arse from him. You know, he's, he's blackmailing people that are absolutely not going to have it, you know? Yeah, but obviously the whole point you find out is so they don't obviously know. Yeah. And Eric Barlow there as our policeman. I don't know, look how sulky Ed looks there. That's great. Well, he just looks knackered, doesn't no, he? No, yeah, I know. But now, that there is Belinda, who is Melissa and, I left, suppose, Kate's there. stunt double, the one with the blonde hair there, that's Belinda. So you've already seen her all through the movie, jumping, falling off cliffs, having a rucksack exploded. Yeah, she's pretty hardcore. Her, yeah, her and a guy called Chris Newton uh, were the two main stunt people. Just to say earlier, you saw a pub sign there. It said the Buchel. That is what climbers refer to Buchel et Eve Moor, which is the mountain in the opening of the movie. Buchel et Eve Moor, loose translation, meaning the great herdsman of et Eve. So, you know, we didn't want sort of to do the... Uh, to do the pub and name it after something else it was quite nice to name it after. And this, this, some of this stuff is really difficult because um, in, in this sort of time of year at Scotland, you maybe get two, three hours of night a night, and it's sort of we're sort of trying to shoot a night shoot. Uh, you're trying to shoot day for night, evening for night, night for night, and then it's sort of so it's sort of in the grade and trying to match it. You know, there's sort of a million different things happening when you're stopping down to try and match it, and you're you got something yeah. So but I think they've done a pretty good job on the whole. Well, even like that wide shot just there. We were shooting this during the day, and in the grading, they had to darken the outside here and stuff, you know, because obviously there's so little darkness uh, when we were shooting. Yeah, in, uh, it's really hard actually. In June. I love this scene. I think uh, I think both of these actors play this scene very, very well, very, very straight. Uh, I think it's you know I, I remember uh, you know we you and I the way we write you writing sort of one section of the movie once we mm, decided on the whole story you you take one route I take another route then we go over each other's work but this one I just sort of sat in a library in Henley on Thames and wrote this in a few hours or whatever and I was really really happy with it I don't think we changed very much of it at all no I don't think so you did yeah because your first pass at this wasn't no I didn't like my first pass it just it went, it went off on a tangent and sort of yeah. But this, yeah, you get a sense of, you know, just who they are and what they've done. And I mean, if you, you've sort of got that sense already. But. Also, this is the second game of poker in the movie. You know, we've had the game of poker with the climbers, and this is the game of poker with the biggest bluff of all, is that Mr. Kidd has nothing to sell. No. Nothing to bargain with at all. This is his, you know, and I love the fact that he, um, you know, I love the fact that he says, you know, uh, you, know uh, you give me the money, I'll go off and phone you and tell you where the girl is. And in some movies, you know that they go, OK. And I'm like, no, no, no. No, 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 no. Carell Rodin is way too... Look at him. He looks streetwise. Yeah, he He's does. not going to fall... You know, the other thing I hate in a movie is when someone's got a gun and someone else has dropped the gun, the person drops the gun and then the bad guy shoots him. He's like, never drop a gun. Never drop a gun if someone's pointing a gun at you. Unless, unless it's the police. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but if someone's, you know, if someone's holding a hostage and tells you to drop their gun, it just don't. Yeah. Absolutely. That's what I really liked about the end of Deadly Pursuit. Or, or you can sort of lower it, then quickly bring it back up and shoot in the head. I see that a lot in movies. No, but I liked. I, what's that film? Shoot to Kill in America. Deadly Pursuit over here. And at the end, Clancy Brown just tells Sidney Poitier to drop the gun, and he just won't. He's done the mistake once. And then he just goes bang and shoots the guy in the flipping shoulder or whatever it is. I like that. I just it's streetwise. That is know? actually a really cool film. I've got so a... underrated. I love it. Um, His parents decided they wanted to hand off a bag full of shredded. Meat. So this obviously is a bit of a past history of Mr. Kidd, really just showing you that he's he's international basically. With yeah, his, this is another thing. Somebody, with this child kidnapping, he's in France. He's they've been to Scotland. France. They've had a Japanese kid. Whether that Japanese kid was in Japan or not is irrelevant. No. Somebody actually wrote, "Oh, why are they dealing in euros?" In uh, I'll tell you exactly in, Japan, why, in Scotland, they're not going to stay in Scotland. No, no, no. But I'll tell you exactly why. Because five hundred euros. I think they've actually faced their five hundred euro note out because it's basically used so much for uh, for crime because it's the biggest denomination note I think in the world. So obviously, you can pack a hell of a lot of money into a small space. And I think actually, it's something, if anything is going to date the film, it's the fact that I think they phased that out. Uh, something else somebody put online and said there's a goof in the film, which is earlier they talk about euros, and then they say that Carell Rodin says he bets six million US. He yeah. doesn't say US, he says, I bet six million euros. But because he's right, got that yeah. accent, he goes, euros. Yeah. Some people might think he's saying US. He's not, he's saying euros. We're not that can, flipping can, appalling can, in our continuity. We turn, we turn the euros into US dollars. Uh, yeah, so that's, actually so that's see an the... incorrectly mentioned goof. And now we've got our fireworks and everything else, of course, which is going to create a lot of the confusion and panic within this police station scene. Do you remember in the first draft there was no police station? They just no, went they just into a house. Up in a house and, fence up. And, and then that just, you know, and then we sort of logically said it doesn't matter how paranoid or scared they are, the first place you're going to go, it doesn't matter what happened, you're going to go to the police station. But also, talking about fake-outs earlier, this is also sort of another, you know, to try and fake the audience out, think that um, that uh, Sergeant Grey's in on it as well. That's I like that line there as well, which says, you don't have to be rude, and I like the response, fuck rude. <laughs> you know, fuck rude. I, I like that, and he's absolutely right. I think Ed here, this is a real compliment to Ed here as well. Ed Thanks. has got to follow, Ed and Melissa here have got to follow Sean Harris and Corral Rodin, who are absolute heavyweights. And I think that this scene is just as gripping for very different reasons than the previous scene. And I think Ed and Melissa here are absolutely flawless. I think they, they completely draw you in. And I love the fact it's a whispered conversation, so it makes sense to come in quite tight with the shots. And, also, uh, I really like the line, even if, he is, even if he's not in it, what can he do? He's a fat man with a badge on with a biro. I think that's pretty funny. I was pleased with that line because that was me that wrote that. No, I was pleased with that. Well, well, it made sense no, as yeah. well. It makes perfect sense. Yeah, what, what's what? to stop Mr. McRae just walking in here and and doing a Terminator? I'll be back and just smashing the place up anyway, you know? Yeah. There we go. The pyro. That's the one. Melissa's great. Yeah, you know, she just the audience here are Melissa. You know, they're they're just sort of okay, you know. And yeah, this is obviously yeah, Ed's character's gone completely on his arc, and he's now. Yeah. Where are you going? We're just... We're leaving. Yeah. It's not safe out there. Well, we're going. Absolutely not. And of course, here we are. Uh, didn't you, um. Well, the paranoia here, the other thing. Didn't, here, you, eat, if you, want to go didn't you eat a slice of the prop cake, which is regular cake, which they spray the stuff off just to stop they, shine? They sprayed D shiner all over it, and I ate some, and then someone said that. Yeah, that was a bit weird. Yeah. Again, this is us, uh, you know, playing on the paranoia. Why not keep, you know, keep the audience paranoid? Who can you trust? I don't know who to trust. Why, you know, why. Why would you trust the policeman? But the policeman would be perfectly correct. You know, you've come in here with this story. I can't let you walk out with that girl. You know, and here I had a lot of fun editing this because this is by far the sort of faster sort of parts of cutting in the movie. Um, it's still not super, super cut, 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 cut for the sake of it, but um, we didn't have all the geography we wanted for this scene. A lot of the locations were in a different place. So funnily enough, the editing in this scene is probably most like Reckoning Day. Yeah, you know, it's, it's stringing together loads of uh, di disparate locations that actually geographically have nothing to do with each other. But, one, but for, for one reason or another, and maybe it's a bit of a happy accident, but because the editing the editing's really quite frantic and it, it adds to a lot of confusion, but you're still getting the, 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 the impression of what's going on. And maybe by not having the geography, we're actually experiencing the scene much more from Ed and Melissa's point of view i.e. chaos and mayhem, yeah. than, we are, maybe, yeah. than we are with, you know, perhaps geography showing the gunman in the shot and... 
You can actually see a few shots. The camera's sensor sort of uh, That's digital has blood. quite a hard time coping with the fireworks. Yeah, you just get to sort say of uh, white streak across the bottom of the image. That's digital when that window gets smashed behind there. Yeah. But um, also when uh, the policeman was shot in the head there, we had two seconds left or whatever. We had no time. Uh, so that was fake blood coming out of his head. Someone asked about those CGI birds. That's completely real. Those yeah, you start because we he there. was firing off. He was firing off blanks. I filmed that shot. I was on a crane filming that. He's firing off blanks, and obviously this is one of the good things. I love this. When you fire off blanks, birds go absolutely mental and fly through your shots. I love that with the whip. I really do. Earlier on with that baby owl, it might have been quite good to fire a blank just to film it and see what you've done. No, that's a horrible thing. No, <laughs> no I know, but you know, yeah, no, I would have no, just no, fallen no, out no. of the, the tree. The owl is sweet. No, no, he's a baby. No, no. no, I thought I was joking. He's joking, guys. He's not that horrible. Please don't write in. He's a softy, really. I love this. I just think this film. I think this film is just building. It's becoming such a crescendo, and and you know, uh, and I still think you know, you know, Mr. McRae is doing it his way, which is he is bulldozing through the thing. He is going to get that child back by any means possible. And uh, and uh, you know, I love that that bit there with was the a flaming whip and everything else. It's like it's like you know. Also, the other thing from the visual point of view of this whole end sequence is that you know it's a bit like hell. You know, the color, the color palette's all reds and fire and flame. And my attitude is, well, Alison's going to go through hell and hopefully come out the other side in order to do the right thing. You know. Um, but there were, there was originally sort of more um, just after this sort of chasing through the um, the alleyways, wasn't it, Mister Mer? Mr. McRae pursuing them, they weren't initially sure if it was him or not, and he got mobbed up. We didn't have a chance to shoot it, it was properly. just we time. Didn't have the schedule. And, yeah, it was just time and light. So this is basically, this film was shot in six weeks, which is sort of for an action film, considering the difficulties of filming. I mean, if it was studio based, you could do it probably quite easily, but, you know, abseiling down into locations and stuff like that takes a long time. So it's a yeah. really, really hectic. But at least we had, you know, two, two and a half weeks of second unit on top of that, plus a week of pickups later. And so, oh, no, so I'm just did, saying yeah. it's, it's pretty ambitious to shoot a sort of full on, I guess, action movie. In yeah. this sort of in this sort of inhospitable environment in um, in six yeah. weeks, it's quite hard. it's pretty hard work. I love this bit. You know, I just like uh, it's not based on trust. It's based on what I can see in front of me. I like his analogy. It makes perfect sense. So stop fucking around. You're getting nothing until I see the girl. Until I see the girl. And I really looks like he means it as well. Having said that, this scene that's just coming up here. Yeah, we shortened it, but we added the line in an ADR, he's got a gun, so obviously there's something wrong. Yes, it's quite a sort of a short Because, yeah, originally they doing. were, like, walking through the crowded back streets and yeah. um, there was this guy following them in a pig mask and, and they, they weren't sure if it was him or not. But we just did, the light fell and we just didn't Funny enough, time. though, having said that, you've got to be picking up the pace at this stage. Yeah. Now, you know, funny enough, a lot of people have said here... They can't believe you've just killed Ed in such a sort of callous way. Ed wasn't perhaps as likable in the initial script. And the other thing is, of course, that Paul Anderson's character is yeah, a bash at the Yanks. Or makes the ironic comment, we leave friendly fire to the Yanks, then promptly kills someone in a moment of friendly fire. Exactly, and kills one of our heroes. Um, and, uh, if someone said, like, oh, I don't know how that line's going to get done in America, but it's like the whole point is he's an idiot. You know, he does then kill someone. And the fight. answer is I've seen it at Action Fest in North Carolina and I've seen it in uh, Canada and I'm about to see it at Fantastic Fest in a couple of weeks and I tell you, it goes down a storm. They find it, they find it very, very funny. You know, and the other thing they find really, really funny is the Christian Bale line, you know. Uh, I like the Christian Bale line. He's basically saying he's going to go like John Wayne in there, you know, I, he's going to go mental. And if anyone has seen the Christian Bale rant on YouTube, they will know what I mean. It is ballistic and deeply unpleasant. And then, of course, Carell here reacting. We didn't have enough time to do all this, so it's quite nice. I like the blood on the lens there, but because we didn't have time to choreograph this fight properly, it's nice that we were able to cut yeah, to Yeah, we cut side, it short, we cut it short. Cut it way fun. short. Because there was a sort of bit of a scrap, and then they ran for the window, but it was just like, it's not working. Do you know what, it's, it's, as long as you've got cutaways... Yeah, you can get past. And the other thing we've done there, a bit like Saving Private Ryan, instead of blood coming out, which would get lost in that, just have puffs. You yeah, know, like puffs of smoke. Puffs of smoke, which basically look like clothing, just, you know... You know, and then this is just mixing up sort of a, that sort of completely different place. Yeah, that's not even sure there, but it's enough. This sort of manic bit, you know, ultimately, if we'd had a bit more time, we could have made that slicker. But if, funnily enough, you know, with the sound design and everything, it just about 
you know, just about gets, and I love these shots here, but you know, you just, as long as you can keep the confusion and just keep it short and to the point. Some people here thought this was just too much where he just pushes the guy out the way, but you know, it's that. That's one of our main stuntmen, Chris Newton. Yeah, he's done all the stunts in the movie, a bit like uh, Belinda, he's had his moment. But you know, you, by this stage, Mr. McRae is absolutely full of rage. He's an unstoppable force by this stage. And uh, you know, somebody said, oh, you know, if this really happened, the, the police would be all over the place. It's like, well, sorry to bring up horrendous subjects like Hungerford or something like that, but if people some... do take a long time to react, and also you're in, you know, miles away. They even say miles away from any big police stations. So. You, you'd get, you know, out out here, you'd get, you'd get an hour to get an armed response team out here. And by then, whoever wants to shoot up the damn place can do what they like. Um, this scene here, though, you know, actually, funnily enough, my wife pointed out, why have you got? Why are you spending time with Chris and you haven't spent any time with Ed? Dead on the floor. And I thought that was a good point. Maybe we could have had... Uh, it. Yeah, I was thinking watching the other day, I was thinking we needed a shot, a sort of final shot of Ed, a little goodbye shot, just to sort of... Maybe even Chris and Ed almost acknowledging each other that he got the wrong guy and Ed sort of saying... I, I don't know. I don't you know. Chris, actually, Ed, do I? Ed, Chris just shoots him again. <laughs> And this is actually all this building front here. This is a set. Uh, um, yes, yeah, they were building. This is one of the last things we shot, and this is a set they were building throughout production. It's just sort of every day, just got more and more impressive as they sort of started. It's really well it. lit this. And gratuitous shotgun pump coming. And one of the things I actually do have to, I don't do it in this film, but I see in films with pump action shotguns is people just spend every other shot they're pumping it, like they don't. Yeah. Need to, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, you know, it's just gratuitous shotgun pumping. There you go. That's Jamie Angel, stunt coordinator. He's responsible for some of the great stunt work you've seen. You've just seen him now and following. And you just saw him going through the window, and he's a, he's the coordinator of everything here. And I like I like this sort of this again, you know, that the whole thing of you know our reasoning behind this last part of the movie that I think was lost on you know some people over here, but you know I think most people seem to like and get is that you know for most of the movie the mountains are the very dangerous location, but by the end you're taking comforting locations like a police station or a family home and you're making them incredibly dangerous and precarious so that there's nowhere safe there's nowhere safe in this movie to go or be yeah and i think this is probably the most violent part of the film this is you know look at look her smashing his head there you know and and you know I mean, yeah this is yeah this is great this i mean melissa looks absolutely he's really scary isn't he he's, he's quite sort of and look at that, just from the acting point of view, getting the knife exactly where it needs to be. Yeah, you know, and that's, uh, you know, I just think it's, it's just enough, you know. And yes, you know, it's, it's starting to get a bit Hollywood, this. It could be like the end of Scream or whatever. But ultimately, you know, it was never going to be a sort of, she was never going to have a showdown with both of them. You know, no, and I... ultimately she was going to have the showdown with the more physical one. Alison's a very physical character. We were never going to put a, a weapon in Alison's hand. Uh, we were never going to give Alison weapons like a gun or a this or a that. Oh, yeah, she starts throwing, like, sort of, yeah, belay clips at him, wasn't it? Oh, God, yeah, or an ice axe in the head or something, you know. Well, they could, I suppose they could use those fold-up spades from earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah. would have, yeah. That yeah but could... her, she's lost her rucksack in the river anyway. Oh, that's true, yeah, okay, the fold-up spades are out of it. I love Michael's music here. It's almost... The one thing about this scene, it's almost like domestic violence or something like daddy's home, you know, the, 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 the <laughs> bastard abusive husband or whatever. No, but, Sorry. you know, this completely dysfunctional kind of family. <laughs> no, but the dysfunctional family that this movie is, this is this terrifying kidnapper. And, you know, like in hostage situations, the kidnapper can become the sort of the, the father figure in a horrible way. And Stephen McCall wanted to put this line in. Hello again. Yeah, it's pretty good. And the only way that Alison is ever going to beat that guy is by catching him off balance in those split seconds and taking the opportunity. And this gets a big cheer. A big cheer, and also by that well sound deserved, design, to be fair. it was your idea to write him falling and snapping his back in two, and I think that... It's quite a hard stunt to do, it's sort of three stages. Worked. It worked. Again, it's just quite old-school filmmaking, and I think it works really, really nicely. Uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, that's a moment. I think by that stage, Stephen McColl as Mr. McRae is just one of the most menacing, most evil and, and possibly most dislikable characters. Also, I think that's as close as we'll ever get to having someone fall on a spike. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah, think yeah. that's maybe, <laughs> I think that's a sort of, I think that's our sort of generic fall on a spike moment, but done slightly That's not green screen there. That was Holly on a safety wire that was digitally erased. She really was hanging out of a third floor but window. But she, she loved it, didn't she? Yeah, absolutely loved it. Yeah, she was pretty brave. Um... 
In the first draft of the second draft of the script, uh, Alison has the little girl Anna and she's holding Anna close and the flames are burning towards them and then she says, close your eyes, Anna, and we cut to black, trying to trick the audience into thinking they're both going to die. And then I realise audiences are too savvy. They, they know we're not going to kill yeah, a child. Yeah, yeah, not no, in sure. a mainstream movie like this. It's not going to... We're not going to be chucking in fantasy. Do, do, do you think anyone falls for that? I mean, because we... A lot we of people did. Oh, really? Because we cut to black for five seconds. Yeah. It's actually that moment if the film had ended and I was watching this and hadn't been involved in this and I'd be like, oh, for God's sake. God yeah, it'd be irritating. It yeah, I mean, you know? it's... I mean, here's the thing. I think, um, you know, here, I think we... I think it's quite a good... You know, I think it... You know, I think it's. I think it's so enough you, to so convince enough people. So you've spoken to people, people who've fallen for that. A lot of people thought Melissa was going to die here. Oh, yeah, really? especially over in the festivals of Fantasia and Action Fest, they all thought she was dead. But she'd sacrifice. It was okay because yeah. she'd saved the child. And then we have to give them something back. I mean, we have literally demolished all the climbers. Been quite unsympathetic with our lead characters. I mean, there's... we have, and knowing you and I, we probably, you know what, over a drink or two, we could have easily decided to kill Alison off as well. Yeah. <laughs> I don't you know, know. Yeah, I think that would have been a bit... Maybe the soft, soft side of us came out. I mean, yeah. what was it Philip French said? A heartless but effective thriller. So he really liked it, but I think he thought we were we were quite savage with our leads. With our characters, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, no, I think I think people probably are a bit shocked with that Ed Spillers yeah. getting shot in the back by This moment coming up, the stump people said there's no way he's just going to be able to drag him out of the car. But with Chris Newton helping him a bit, I was like, I don't want him to slowly pull him out or open the door and then pull him out. I wanted to just drag him out like that, just be a complete bang. And you buy it. Yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah, and somebody was telling me the other day that was unnecessary to hit him three times. I'm like, hold, you know, they were having a conversation about violence. It's like, you've got to neutralise that character. I also think, you know, I, 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 yeah, I... Yeah, he's such a punching. such a horrendous sort of individual, Mr. Kid, that I just think, you know. I like that as well. Mr. Kid falls down and then Alison rises up. I, I like that. I like the sort of the cutting there. And then obviously by now the police are here. I would have liked a bit more time here. I'd have liked to have had a tighter shot of Holly with the policewoman there. You saw in yeah, the wide. Maybe. Yeah, sure. I'd have liked a bit more time to have just, just covered this scene a bit better. Yeah, you know we got our wide there. I'd have liked to have had a bit more coverage, actually. That's I think. Nice. Uh, close in there. Yeah, there's a nice bit of coverage there, and I think initially there was a bit more dialogue, and ultimately I think it was just, you know what? And also that was it in the, in the script earlier on. Melissa gives her a kiss on the forehead just before she uh, belays her down off the cliff uh, and lures her down off the cliff, and ultimately we said just save it. You know, don't give her a kiss until the end when you're you're safe. You know. And Carell Road in there is smiling, not in an evil way. He knows the girl's safe. She's with the police, yeah. She'll be returned to her mother. And this is... Uh, this is this Anyone is who of... knows there, that's that's a futuristic number plate. We shot this in 2010. Yeah. That's yeah. a 2013 plate. This here is uh, evening for night and then goes into night for night, so it's a bit of a mixture of the two. And there's the midges having fun. Yeah, Carell see... Road and love the midges. Well, so now having lights at night with midges, I mean, it does attract pretty large numbers of huge bugs it's got a really nice steely look to it this scene hasn't it it's got a really sort of you know much more desaturated actually than in other parts of the movie but um but i don't really think you do you get the size the sense of how big his sort of henchmen are here i was it's like they it's were ridiculous. Enormous. well the thing is is that carell rodin and sean harris none of these actors are, are carell's midgets, about you know. six three yeah but you know what i noticed from working before with actors a lot of actors are just dwarves but, you know, our, our cast in this movie weren't, to be fair. Most of them were, were pretty tall. So Sean Harris is six foot tall, and he looks minute compared to these... But this guy, one of these guys must have been just a shade under seven feet tall. I mean, these guys did look like, legitimately quite scary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were that enormous, guy there on the left. Yeah, there. enormous, enormous he's also, He spent works. some time in the gym. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a, lot of, a lot of muscle he's packed on. You know, and, uh, yeah, I think Toby found some big, big bounces from Inverness and... I don't think they were. I think he worked in uh, Pizza Hut or something. Did he? Yeah. Well, there you go. Really? Yeah, he saw him in the gym. All right, OK. And he was like, do you like films? He's like, I love films. Like, do you want a beer in one? <laughs> it was that simple. Brilliant. I really yeah. I think there's good makeup on Sean there. He does, he's been properly, properly messed up. Yeah, I remember actually Sean said, oh, I think I should be taken out of the car naked. And we were like, no, 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 they're not going to strip you. Yeah, yeah, calm down, mate. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You Put, know? It <laughs> Put it away. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. They they ultimately strip him here, 
And I, again, you know, Sean was like, I don't think I should say anything in this scene. I was like, try it. You know, try, you know, it's ridiculous, but it's a pathetic little plea. Yeah. If you can get away with it, you'll try to just buy your way out of this. It's, it's got to be worth a try. And didn't um, sort of mum say, actually, sort of, she's so glad that we didn't film any of the torturing in this. Yeah, a few people say that, because, I mean, if you've seen, if any of anyone here has seen Rise of the Foot Soldier, there's a it doesn't, it doesn't through. Skim, it doesn't skimp on the torture. No, there's the Turkish. Extreme violence. No, Rise of the Foot Soldier. If this had been Rise of the Foot Soldier, they'd be repeatedly <laughs> stoving his head in and, and, and sort yeah. of hacking him up and ripping his yeah. fingers out and fingernails out and yeah, bits of hand. And, and the film would have ended in a five-minute orgy of blood and carnage. A five-minute yeah. gore orgy. Absolutely. Gornography. Gornography. No, I think, you know, we very much wanted a 15 certificate, sort of, you know, right from the off. Um, you know, it's... Uh, but I think you can get away with quite, a, you know, quite a lot in a 15. I see some incredibly sort of bloody 15s, I think, it's as long as it's not gratuitous, hopefully. Yeah, and as long as there's not too much nudity, because obviously, you know, the censors are terrified of naked women. And but, men. And men. But for some, well, actually, I think you've got a little bit of dick action coming up, no, actually. No, there isn't any. Well, no, there is. If you if if, if you actually freeze frame, so, um, he's yeah. Prepare there. If you actually freeze frame there, guys, you, right. you, you get a bit of dick. Calm yourself. <laughs> um, I like that line. Put him in the ground. Prepare my tools. You know, a lot of people quote that back to us. Yeah, you know something bad's going to happen, but we're not going to see it. We're just going to imagine it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of dissolves, but that one works. And that's you with a second unit shot there. You just wait till it gets a bit light. It looks good. Yeah, we, yeah, we, yeah. And uh, and he goes off for a different adventure. We, we basically I said he it, was made of rock. He was never going to uh, yeah, not survive I thought it could have been quite cool to just have him get, you know, a sniper suddenly, bang, the window of the car explodes and he gets on the, the sniper gets on the radio and he radios dark or whatever and they've betrayed him. Oh, really? Did you think that? No, I, I like the fact right, that it was said that I came up with that idea after yeah, we made the entire film, so... Very, I like, it's I not like, very helpful when you do that. No, no, it's not. And I like the honour of it, the fact that they didn't break each other's trust. Yeah, Andy's off for another adventure. And I think she's, and then here as well, you know, Melissa didn't cry during the movie. There's no part where the character of Alison's crying. And then I think finally she uh, she's allowed to just relax and break down. And Sophie Ramsey... Sang the opening track. Who sung the opening track, The Burning of Ark Doon, is now here singing the closing track Which about King where did you James. Hear, where did you hear these songs? Or did, did you source them or did my This This isn't one that we recorded. This is one that she recorded on her album. Oh, OK. And, uh, yeah, no, it was... Uh... OK, yeah, we're done. Well, yeah, I'm That's... just going to talk a little bit about the Super 8 footage yeah. and my thoughts behind it. Um... Throughout the movie, you see some sort of, uh, or rather, throughout these credits, uh, you see some uh, Super 8 footage, which uh, comes on screen about now. We needed a little bit of gap from the movie before bringing it up, I think. You know, so a few uh, credits, and there we are. So this is uh, that's, that, the, yeah, that's the waterfall that, that we, we comped in earlier on in the sequence of the. Yeah, not um, from my Super 8 footage, obviously. No. And then it was nice here was to just see the characters again. Just you know, rebring back to life, or at least in sort of a sort of a way, just to see them all having fun towards the beginning of their holiday. And then ultimately, yeah, I just I sort of filmed it with the uh, scenery shots that we shot throughout. That's a lot of that was shot in the August when we went back yeah, up. Pick up shooting. And then here, what I did is I did a transition from, as you can see, a sort of a summer shot there. I did a load of Super 8 footage, uh, winter mountaineering that spring which I was always going to use, and that's on the Anahigak in Glencoe, one of the most amazing days, winter climbing. And that's basically where I sort of wanted to show what potentially might be their early footage or shots of the climbers, and, 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 and it's really just meant to be sort of the environment in general. That's my ice axe there. Uh, it's just meant to sort and of you, just, just keep the feel of the film. And you, that, this, that there, right there, is being filmed on Bucoletid Moor, where we shot the opening scene. That's abseiling down Curve Ridge in winter. And actually, two weeks after we came off there in February 2010, two people got killed on Bucolet or avalanche. an avalanche on the east face, which is very, very unlikely. But then I was told the other day, actually, it was a horrible, really strange day, and people just didn't want to be on the mountains that day. 
It is quite, yeah, I remember going um, into a, a shop just to buy sandwiches or something and telling them we were going up Bucareti more one day and the lady behind the thing just said, be careful, that mountain's a killer. Well... Which really did my calm, a lot of good when we went to climb like that. Well, you did it the in the wall. summer 209 and um, the thing was that, you know, Bucareti more had killed three people that winter and then two people the following winter, all in avalanche. Again, this is, that's the view from the opening scene, but in wintertime, that's yeah. Richard Bentley, who, of course, doubled... Uh, I don't know in the opening scene. Yeah, 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 absolutely. But um, you know, the, the, you know, it's it's worth mentioning. It's very, very, very serious environment. Very serious environment that, that that we were shooting in. You know, and it's not to be you know underestimated. People are killed up in the Scottish mountains every winter and every summer. Uh, thankfully, not as many as in the Alps, where I've just come back from. That's bucoletted more in the winter there. But um, you know, it's uh, just a. Uh, you know, I think it's really nice just to keep these super eight sort of shots flowing on, and just it gives a sort of a sort of a, I think a sort of a, a sort of an extra sort of nice sort of bit of closure to the movie. You know. Yeah, it's nice. A lot it's of good. it was done. You know, that was that was actually at this waterfall. Where was it? Rogi Falls. Where that we was where we were going to shoot the river stuff, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Did, yeah. It was a sort of. It would have been great if we could have done, done a mix and match of the two, but it's just like shift that waterfall there. Yeah, that was it's the cool It was um it's just sort of, you know, getting the crew to Now that I cut location. that's the Rannet Wall from the opening scene. That's the north face of the Eiger from the station window. Um and that's about two thousand five hundred foot up the north face of the Eiger there. I want and that's uh, also out in the Alps. I wanted to cut some shots in of the Alps because obviously the Allison character was talking about climbing the Eiger and so I wanted this to look like potentially some of her footage. So we end there on the north face of the Eiger, perhaps Alison's next challenge. 